Have you ever been in a situation in a video game where you've got this really cool weapon or a mega health potion, but you don't want to use it? Because it's got limited durability, really rare ammo, or you've only got so many of them, and so you go the whole game without ever actually getting to use it at all. Or alternatively, you might find a really easy way to get items, like Destiny 1's infamous loot cave, so you just farm that for ages instead of actually playing the game. Resource management systems are one of the most effective tools in the game designer's arsenal to control the way people play their game. Unfortunately, they're also one of the most unpredictable, with a lot of well-intentioned ideas sometimes having the opposite effect they were supposed to, but I'm getting ahead of myself. I want to break down how resource management works so that we can figure out not just how to do it well, but also how to avoid situations where a shortage or surplus of resources tricks players into playing in a boring way. I think these systems can be best explained with the idea of pushing and pulling. In games where certain resources are very limited, players are pushed away from styles of play that are inefficient or would risk them running out of a critical resource. Take Resident Evil for example, which uses resource management to make even concepts like silly Spanish zombies and hillbilly dads scary. The scares in Resident Evil don't come from zombies jumping out of closets, but the creeping dread that comes with running out of the only thing that will stop you from getting eaten. Bullets. Firing blindly at bad guys with your SMG here will mean you'll be out of ammo in approximately no time at all, meaning that instead you've got to line up headshots, as well as finish off grumpy villagers with melee attacks where you can. Both of these ammo saving tricks, which require you to either let villagers close in or get into melee range yourself, bring you closer to danger and so closer to interesting gameplay. This is all aided by the fact that the game will sneakily increase enemy health and lower ammo drops in response to your performance, meaning you'll be constantly teetering on the edge of being out of ammo without ever completely running dry, keeping you in that great zone where you get to make tough decisions about what ammo you're going to use to stay alive and what you're going to try and save, but also because having to kill enemies with nothing but your crappy knife takes bloody forever. The flip side of this would be the idea of pulling, where a player is drawn towards styles of play that make effective use of very plentiful or infinite resources. In games like Dark Souls or Celeste, infinite resources are used to encourage players to explore and experiment. Dark Souls' Esther's Flasks, which is a bit of a tongue twister, replenish whenever you head back to a bonfire, so you can feel free to chug them in the middle of a doomed boss fight or when you're exploring a new area, confident in the knowledge that you'll just get them back later. Celeste's infinite lives means that players can experiment with finding alternate routes and secrets without fear of a game over or losing anything more than a few seconds of progress. This helps to take away a lot of the pressure and reminds players that failure is just another step on the journey to success. By altering the strength of these two forces, as well as playing them against each other, designers can manoeuvre players into engaging with the game in a particular way, while still letting them feel like they're in control by letting them come to this conclusion themselves. For example, in Islanders, a very cute city builder, your primary limiting resource isn't building materials or cash like you'd expect, but space. You need to build structures in order to get points, but the more built up an island becomes, the harder it is to find space for big, complicated structures like temples, which generate loads of points but are massive and hard to place, or huts, which only generate points away from populated areas. Each building you place needs to be considered in the context of the next hundred or so taverns, towers or gardens you'll be putting next to it, as you try to make the most efficient use of your dwindling space as possible pushing players away from strategies where they just place structures without thinking, and in doing so, creating some very pretty villages, as well as encouraging a more interesting, long-term strategic style of play. Health is a great way to encourage players to act in a particular way, because running out means dying, and people don't usually want that. Doom's glory kill system, which seems to come up all the time in these videos, pulls players into using it because it's an easy way to restore your very limited health, keeping you in the fight for longer. Similarly, in Descenders, a roguelike mountain biking game, you can gain extra health for completing bonus objectives that involve doing lots of tricks or going really fast. Both of these strategies, bouncing from glory kill to glory kill and pulling off backflips at death defying speeds are the most fun way to play, and thanks to a bit of developer fiddling they're also optimal, meaning the players are encouraged to play in the way that's most fun. It's even possible for a resource to push and pull in different contexts. In Frostpunk, a steampunk survival city builder, that may as well be called running out of coal the video game, you're never going to have enough of resources like wood, steel and of course delicious black gold, pushing you into expanding your city's gathering efforts to heat homes, research tech and not die. Pretty simple stuff. What's more interesting though is manpower, which starts off as a pulling force. People are generally easy to come across and massively help your city because research stations, gathering outposts, hospitals and of course brothels 
all need to be staffed by people. More people means more of those critical resources, which means faster expansion and a better chance of winning. At least in the early game. Later on, however, the balance changes, and survivors actually become a pushing force, putting strain on your economy instead of helping it. As the weather gets worse, your city will be swarmed with refugees from neighbouring settlements, including lots of useless hungry children. Suddenly, you've got more survivors than you know what to do with, as each building only has a limited capacity for workers, but even unemployed people need healing, feeding and heating, creating a great moral conflict and of pushing your infrastructure to the limits in order to do the right thing or turning away people you once would have begged to join because you got too many mouths to feed as it is. By changing which resources do the pushing and the pulling, games can shape specific, memorable experiences out of the same broad set of mechanics. However, like all things to do with psychology and manipulating people's brains, it doesn't always work. As we've already seen, sometimes resource management systems can trick players into having exactly the wrong experience by moving them into gameplay styles that are exploitative, boring, or don't engage with the best parts of the game. In the words of Soren Johnson, lead designer of Civ 4 and Offworld Trading Company, given the opportunity, players will optimise the fun out of a game. We can see this very clearly in the otherwise great Subnautica, as well as a lot of other games with survival mechanics. In Subnautica, the lack of food and water pushes players into exploring slowly, making the world beyond the safe shallow seem scary and foreboding. To start with, the only way you can make half decent foods and drinks is back at your base, encouraging you to build a permanent place to live and further hammering home the idea that the outside world is dangerous and that you'll need to prepare to survive it. However, these two resource shortages are easier to fix than the developers intended. By making an early game tool that literally cooks fish for you straight out of the water, the Thermal Blade, you have an inexhaustible food supply that also restores a bit of water. This means that instead of creating tense scenarios where you've got to think on your feet and make tough choices to survive in scary inhospitable biomes, you've instead just got to waste time killing and cooking peepers for a few minutes whenever you get peckish or thirsty. Eating cooked fish to restore vitals isn't even that efficient, particularly for water, but it is easy and it is free, so players can't help but do it, and in the process, make the game less fun. In Pokemon, and a lot of other JRPGs, the fact that you need exponentially more XP to level up is supposed to pull players towards new, more challenging content that helps them level up much faster, but this doesn't always work. If there's a particularly hard boss like a gym leader blocking the way, there's very little reason for players not to spend ages grinding away at low level stuff until they can trivialise whatever's in their way, completely throwing off the progression curve. And in the brilliantly named Void Bastards, you're encouraged to use stealth tactics and a bunch of cool gadgets like kitty bots to distract enemies and save on precious ammo. But when you die and get given a new character, you get a bunch of food, fuel and ammo for free anyway, removing any sense of tension the otherwise well-balanced mechanics could create. Resource management, both for the player and for designers, is a delicate balancing act, but when it's executed well, it can create games that give players unparalleled freedom, but also ones that subtly direct them towards the best kind of experience, which is kind of the best of both worlds. Speaking of worlds, let's put everything we've learned into practice as we look at all the things the brilliant Outer Wilds does right and one major thing it does wrong. The Outer Wilds is all about journeying around a mini solar system in a little rinky dink spaceship, and while you're doing so, managing your health, fuel, and oxygen, which provides some great moments of tension as you jet around deep space and serving as a way to stop you exploring too much too quickly. However, what really drives gameplay in the Outer Wilds? is the threat of running out of time. Some small spoilers coming up, but I won't mention the story or show you any of the really juicy stuff, so don't worry, but if you do want to skip the spoilers, then go to this timestamp here. Okay, cool, see you then. See, in the Outer Wilds, each of the game's planets is on a strict schedule. This comet travels in a weird elliptical orbit that brings it close to the sun for about a minute, Bristle Hollow, a hollow planet, literally falls to bits over time, and massive tornadoes storm across the surface of Giant's Deep, lifting up entire islands into the sky. But that's not all. After exactly 22 minutes of play, the universe… kind of explodes. Yeah. Now, this and the fact that you get to respawn afterwards are pretty core cool to the story, so I won't spoil any of that, but I do want to take a look at how by expertly framing itself around this time limit, Outer Worlds compels the player into engaging with the game in the most fun way possible. 
In order to get your head around the plot and stop the universe going boom, you're going to need to visit each of the planets several times to truly put everything together, but you'll never have enough time to explore everything you want to in a single loop. Finding an escape pod used by mysterious advanced aliens the Nomai on the surface of Embertwin points the way to not just a refugee city buried beneath the surface of the planet, but also to two other escape pods scattered throughout the system. There's no way you'll be able to explore them all within the time limit, meaning you'll have to make some interesting choices in deciding which mysteries to solve now and which to leave for later. This not only helps build anticipation and suspense, but gives each restart a sense of purpose, as there's always a new breadcrumb trail of clues to follow, and each planet is stuffed full of secondary details and plot lines that both flesh out the main story, but also add something new and interesting to discover on repeat visits. By having time as the game's main pushing resource, you're forced to master the strange and unexpected ways each planet changes, whilst also coming to understand all the hidden routes, secrets and areas dotted around the map to get to where you need to go without running out of time. Because time is such a limited resource, but death is merely a setback, Outer Wilds pulls you into making these exhilarating and ultimately lethal journeys of discovery to get just one more piece of the puzzle before the universe explodes and you kick back to the home planet to start again. It's a fantastic little gameplay loop, and without it, the game's brilliant sense of Carl Sagan-esque scientific wonder just wouldn't work. If the game gave you infinite time, or was simply static, there'd be no pressure to push out into the unknown and to take suicidal risks in search of knowledge. But if the punishment for death was too steep, you'd be too scared to take the plunge and explore some of the game's most mysterious and interesting areas. Using these resources together, Outer Wilds pushes and pulls you into exactly the position you need to be in to appreciate the game's scientific wonder to the fullest. Originally, I planned to end the video right here. However, late in my Outer Wilds experience, I stumbled upon a pretty infamous puzzle that kind of rubbed me the wrong way. A secondary spoiler warning here for an endgame puzzle. I'm going to be pretty vague about it, but you know, go to this timestamp to skip it. You know the deal by this point. I'd explored every planet, found out exactly what I needed to do to finish the game, and it was time to execute on the plan. The first step, however, involves waiting on Ash Twin, a desert world for a very specific time window that happens for about a second in a very specific place. But people who've played the game before know exactly where I mean. Because this event only happened near the end of the 22 minute cycle, and it was only available for a tiny window when this big sandstorm was in exactly the right place, suddenly a lack of time was a much stronger motivating factor than normal, and that was a problem. What was normally a really well designed resource shortage pushed me into just waiting on this bridge for ages, not really doing anything, as going to complete side quests might mean I'd miss out on my window of opportunity and would need to wait for 10-15 minutes all over again. I was in a bit of a conundrum. Playing in what seemed like the most effective way possible, and taking as few risks as I could, meant that I wasn't doing what the game was supposed to be all about. Exploring and discovering new and interesting places, not just waiting around in old ones. In these sorts of situations, I'd almost always find myself picking the more effective, less fun option, just like Soren said. But this time, I decided to do something different. So, instead of playing sensibly and just waiting around for the sandstorm, I went exploring, finished a fun side quest that starts with these weird teleporting quantum rocks, and actually had a really fun time rushing back to Ash Twin just in time to start the endgame sequence. It was here that I realised the waiting around problem wasn't entirely the fault of Outer Wilds, it was also a problem with me. Boring strategies like Subnautica's food exploit, or avoiding risks in Outer Wilds, or even holding on to those two cool to use weapons in RPGs, are nearly always going to be optimal, because they ignore two of the most important resources out there, your time, and your fun. And while clever devs have gone some way towards mitigating these problems, they'll never be able to truly fix the fact that efficiency and fun will always be at odds. So the next time you catch yourself playing in a way that's more efficient or safer, but is less fun, maybe think about switching things up. Use those cool limited items, and don't rely on a single overpowered but boring strategy. Sure, this might not be what the game is encouraging you to do, and it's certainly not the optimal way to play, but it is a hell of a lot more entertaining. And, at the end of the day, isn't the best way to play a game whatever optimises the amount of fun you're having and makes the best use of your limited time. Which is why, when you see me playing a game badly, I'm actually just optimising fun. It's not that I suck at games, it's all completely deliberate. Stop looking at me like that. Hi, and thanks for watching. 
Before I do my usual Patreon spiel, I've decided I may as well use this space and my 125 subscribers to promote some smaller and way better channels, so I'm going to do it like here from now on. The first channel I'm going to shout out is the brilliant First Five, a channel that's all about reviewing small games or the first five hours of bigger ones. It's a very neat twist on an established format, and Alex does a great job, go check him out. Anyway, let's get to the people who really matter, my top tier Patreon supporters, who are... Alex Deloch, Asaran, Alno94, Baxter Heel, Brian Otariani, Calvin Han, Colin Herman, Chill, Daniel Metges, Dirk Jan Karenbeld, Feetzalot, Jesse Ryan, Jonathan Christensen, Joshua Binswanger, Leech2, Lucas Slack, Lunar Eagle1996, Mace Window54, Patrick Romberg, Ray's Dad, Samuel Vanderplatz, Strateger in Ultima, Yaren Mirren, and Chow. Thanks for watching, thanks for putting up with me once again, as well as my slow release schedule, I'm working on it I swear, and uh, have a great day. Bye!